welcome to the signal path. Today I wanted to do a tutorial about signal generation, more specifically signal generation for the purposes of timekeeping. So what does that mean? Well, so every time you use a microprocessor, you need to provide the microprocessor with a reference clock signal. This reference clock, of course, advances the execution of the cycles of the program that is running inside the microprocessor. But Signal generation for timekeeping is used in many other places. Every wireless or wireline system has some type of timekeeping mechanism. In fact, uh, every complex system that exists today, GPS, uh, radars, uh, you name it, will have some type of signal generation for that purpose. So there are many ways of doing that. And of course, I'm sure most of you have heard about crystal oscillators. So I wanted to start from there. We'll take a look at the construction of crystal oscillators, how do they work. And I have some vintage crystal oscillators we'll take apart because they're so old and bulky that you can actually look and understand how every bit and piece works together. That's the nice thing about really old equipment because you can learn so much about how these things are manufactured. And then we'll take a look at uh, making our own little oscillator and then comparing the performance of that oscillator versus the crystal oscillator. And then we can see the major advantages of why crystal oscillators are so important and there's so many of them uh, being produced all the time. Another challenge with these type of circuits is that measuring them is not so trivial. So I wanted to also concentrate a little bit about how to measure these type of circuits and how to judge their performance. Um, these uh, type of measurements can be a little bit confusing, so I thought this would be useful if, uh, for you university students who are just getting into experimenting with these type of circuits. So let's get started. Before we take a look at a crystal oscillator in details, let's look at what an ideal signal generation looks like. So if I wanted to produce an ideal sinusoid signal, what properties does it need to have? Well, first of all, an ideal sinusoid signal will be defined by, in voltage, as A, an amplitude, times the sine of F0, which is the frequency we want to generate, versus time. So as time passes from 0 to infinity, you will just get a perfect sinusoid that has no other frequency content except F0, has no amplitude variation, has no phase variation, and it just goes on from 0 to infinity. And if I were to plot that in the frequency domain, the spectrum of that signal will just have energy in only one frequency, frequency F0. Of course, this is the ideal case. Just the thermal limits, the thermal noise of uh, the universe is sufficient to make this impossible. And there are many other challenges why making something like this is impossible. But so what are some of the imperfections that come into play? Well, the amplitude here is constant. In reality, it, it can be and it will be a function of time. Uh, uh, the frequency of not is exactly the frequency you want. In reality, there's going to be an offset. And on top of that, this frequency will drift with time. This sinusoid has no phase. The phase is basically zero. In reality, that phase is going to be a function of time and a complex function of time, causing uh, the, the phase of this uh, sinusoid to move a little bit back and forth with respect to time. That's a, another big problem. So this causes, all of these effects all combined, causes the spectrum of F0 to leak away from the center frequency. So instead of getting this nice uh, sharp impulse here, you will get uh, something that looks more like a skirt. That means there is energy outside the middle F0 band here, and that energy is typically referred to as phase noise, uh, which is a combination of a whole bunch of effects that happens to that signal. So anything you produce is going to look like this, and the idea is to make it more and more like that ideal uh, M impulse at the frequency of F0. So let's take a look and see what a crystal oscillator can do, and uh, we'll take one apart and also measure it, and see how different it is from this ideal case as we get further and further away from this uh, situation. So what is a crystal oscillator? Well, a crystal oscillator is a device that relies on the piezoelectric effect of a piece of crystal to generate a certain frequency. So what do I mean by that? So imagine if I have a crystal that looks like this, that has piezoelectric effect. And piezoelectric effect is the effect that by applying an electric field to this crystal, it will change shape. It will twist, warp, or change thickness. And if I were to apply a mechanical um, pressure to this, it will generate uh, some voltage. So that's a piezoelectric effect. So if I were to take the crystal that, that looks like this, and I would apply, uh, put an electrode at the top, 
and an electrode at the bottom and I apply a positive and negative and have an electric field across this crystal it will slightly change shape and then when I remove the electric field it will bounce back to its original shape causing an inverse electric field to be created and therefore a voltage being created so a crystal can actually act like a resonance circuit just like any object, let's say you have a, um, a piece of steel and a piece of steel has a resonance frequency when you tap it, it will generate a tone that you can hear that tone is this resonance frequency this guy will also be able to generate a resonance frequency and then you can use that resonance frequency to generate a signal that you want so by cutting this piece of crystal into a specific shape and size and thickness and so on you can achieve and tune that resonance frequency for that quartz piece of crystal and then you can build some circuits around it and then use that uh, resonance frequency to create an oscillator so why use a quartz piece of crystal with a piezoelectric effect it's because it happens such that due to the atomic structure and properties of this material the resonance frequency can be well controlled and it can have a very high quality factor what does the quality factor mean? Well, without getting into too much detail, the quality factor of a resonance circuit determines how sharp and how narrow its response is with respect, with respect to frequency. Meaning that it will only be excited and generate a tone at a very, very specific frequency. And as soon as you deviate from that frequency, it will be heavily attenuated. So that's why you can create a very clean tone using a crystal oscillator. So this is what we're expecting if we were to look inside a, a crystal um, used for this type of purposes. So let's take a really old one, take it apart and see if we find something like this. So here I have a box of a whole bunch of different crystal oscillators from uh, various times and from really really old to really really modern. So we'll take a really old one and take it apart. Um, this thing must have been made in the 40s or in the 50s, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, just look at the size of this thing, it's absolutely enormous. You would never find anything like this um, inside a modern device. Especially if you imagine that your phone probably has about 8 or 9 uh, oscillators in it. And, well, they obviously do look nothing like this. And we will take a look at what a modern oscillator crystal looks like. So I'm going to go and take something like this apart. Because it's so big, and the components are so large, it will be easy to, to find and identify the pieces we were talking about before. So let's take, uh, let's take uh, this one and take it apart. So let's see, this one has only three screws in the front. Very, very easy to take apart. This has obviously been hand, um, hand assembled at some point by somebody. So we're going to take this up apart and see if we can find what we're looking for. There's two. And oh, it's already coming apart. And here's the third one. So there's a spring in there that's pushing everything together. So I'm going to try and open it slowly. So I don't know if it's visible on the camera, but there's actually a, a ceiling there's a washer in here that seals this from uh, from elements from the outside so moisture cannot enter uh, enter this uh, little thing and I cannot get this thing to focus very well come on you can do it alright maybe around here so I'm gonna slowly take this apart here we go so there's a little spring inside so that's just a metal plate so put this away and there is a little spring here and the purpose of this spring is obviously to just compress this entire um, thing together. So we'll remove that. There is what appears to be just an insulating plate. I don't think this does anything more than just insulation. And now we can see the inside of this thing. So here's the top plate I was talking about. So one of these guys, this one, connect to this. This is made of copper. So I should be able to just shift this out of the way a little bit, I don't want to bend it too much and underneath it I find I think the metal a metal electrode let's see if I can get this thing out, here we go, that's just a metal electrode so on one side of it is connected to the pad on the other side you got this little circular thing which presses against the crystal so and here is the crystal itself 
There it is. That's it. It looks like a piece of glass, but it's not. It's made of quartz and it's piezoelectric. It's quite, quite thin. And the shape and the size and the thickness of this is what determines the frequency of oscillation uh, or the resonance frequency, I should say, of this uh, crystal. So if I were to break this in two and put it back in here, it would drastically change the resonance frequency of this crystal. So now on the other side, if I continue going down, then there is the other plate that connects to the opposite side of the crystal, and then underneath that will be another copper plate, which then connects to the other pin. So this top plate is on that pin, this pin connects to the bottom one, and in the middle was the sandwich of this, this, and of course this guy in the middle. So this guy just sits on top of this one, and this guy sits on top of that. Quite amazing, and quite enormous that this thing was uh, basically responsible for the resonance circuit. So nowadays, of course, the crystals look very, very different. So let's fast forward a little bit. I would put this back together later because I don't want to break it. Put all these pieces away. So I have a few of these manufactured at, uh, around all around the same time, all vintage. Uh, picked them up from eBay. A lot of cool vintage uh, stuff on eBay available. So here's this one. I like this one a lot. I have two of them, I think. These crystal oscillators, or these crystals, I keep calling them oscillators, these crystals have a glass container. So you can actually see exactly what the inside looks like. I don't know why, uh, I don't think that these are really built um, for use in any instrument or equipment. I've never seen one made from glass like this. Maybe these are for demonstration or maybe they really were used in something. Because generally making something out of a glass container like that is not only very expensive but also doesn't provide a very good electromagnetic shield for interference which can be picked up by the electrodes. Let me see if I can get this thing to focus because this thing is a very pretty actually. Um, there we go. There it is. So you can see exactly what it looks like. There is a crystal in the middle. That's this circular thing. That's the crystal. You see it looks, it's the same color as the one you just saw. The one we just saw was rectangular. And there is a, a one electrode on one side and another electrode on the other side and are connected to the two pins. So this guy is uh, of course tuned to a certain frequency and I think this one is 370 kilohertz which I think is pretty neat. I have another one here, a slightly higher frequency. The crystal is a little bit smaller. Uh, this one has a part number on it. This is also another vintage one. So again, moving a little bit forward, uh, more modern crystals look like this, which you've seen, I'm sure, many times before. This is just, a, again, inside this is the same thing we just saw. Two pins, and this one is at 20 megahertz. Now, this on its own, of course, will not oscillate because you need to build a circuit around it to, to take advantage of the resonance and then generate the tone that you want. So, a lot of times, uh, people build the circuit around and put that in a package and then sell that. So, if you look at one of those ones, a modern one, uh, it will look like this. Here is uh, the most uh, commonly used type of uh, crystal oscillator. It's a lot of hobbyists and um, people, so this is a, a dip package, a through hole package. So this one is listed as being 40 megahertz. You can see this one. Four pins. Uh, one of these pins is ground. One of them is not connected to anything. Uh, this one is uh, uh, at the output and this is VDD. And you can run this one from 5 volts. 